Parade Warden. And when Patrick Joseph Shine said on Lycaster Street in his rich Irish tenor voice, lights out, the damn lights went out all over the neighborhood. Name, please. But Abbott. That's was mine. You don't understand. Hollywood stars left stateside did their part, too, becoming pitchmen for war bonds. Bond, you're saving your money by lending it to Uncle Sam. See, Uncle Sam needs that money uh, to build ships and planes, tanks. And what? Tanks. You're welcome. Virtually everyone would do something for the war effort. At the very least, that meant adjusting to the rationing of a slew of items formerly taken for granted. There was gas rationing, and you had either A stickers or B stickers or C stickers, which um, you put in the windshield of your car, and it told how much gas you were allowed. Cut the use of your car. Save its tires by driving slowly and by driving less. The president appealed to a national sense of collective sacrifice, asking Americans not only to do without, but to actively collect the materials of war. Turn in all the old rubber, anywhere and everywhere. People sent in their rubber toys from their dogs that had died with a letter saying this was Snuffy's favorite toy and please contribute to the rubber scrap dog. Women cut up their girdles and sent them to Roosevelt personally. Kids would gather up the rubber, gather up the aluminum. There were kids' memories collecting tin foil. Everybody felt that what they did mattered. And, and that just was, uh, of, uh, as I reflect back on it, of just in, inestimable importance. And so too were the newsreels and the propaganda films which united the home front in its hatred of the enemy. I remember going and seeing the newsreels, you know, cock-a-doodle-doo, and there you were in the war. I saw it all, an invasion of Europe, and Africa. You could go there and watch two and a half hours of newsreels, and it was wonderful. It was all bombs and shells, and we were immersed in it. You had to hate the enemy, I mean. The Germans were despicable. The Japanese were indefensibly horrible. Or well, the soldiers of Japan who tossed Chinese babies on their bayonets, slaughtered the Chinese people. We knew that uh, unless we were vigilant, uh, it could happen to us. For these men who would be committing these same crimes today in San Francisco, Chicago, or any town. I was 10 years old. To me, a Jap was a Jap, and the only good one was dead. And I su suspect that I pretty well reflected most people in this country in the response to the depiction of the Japanese. The American government's portrayal of the Japanese was as if they were cockroaches, monkeys, beast, subhuman. The fear and loathing of the Japanese brought on by Pearl Harbor had immediate and drastic consequences for Japanese Americans. Notices were posted on the telephone poles saying that all persons of Japanese ancestry were to be removed by such and such a date. It was a sickening feeling. We were quaking in our boots, not knowing what was going to happen to us. What happened was Executive Order 9066, which mandated that all Japanese Americans be removed from the west coast of the United States, where it was feared they might assist any invading force from Japan. In 1941, one of my classmates was George Murakami and his little brother Roy was at the school when we did the school play. I played Thomas Jefferson and George Murakami played George Washington. And we wore the white wigs and did the patriotic speeches. And uh, two weeks later, George Murakami and Roy were taken off to the uh, camp for the Japanese. Some 120,000 Japanese Americans were taken from their homes and businesses and sent by rail to 10 internment camps around the country. And 
Everybody was beginning to settle down on the train. And all of a sudden, I saw my dad, and he is a very unemotional man, a gentleman. But I saw him take out this hanky and go like this, and it just, just overwhelmed me, it just crushed me to think that he was taking it so hard. It was called Heart Mountain, Wyoming, and that was our camp. It had barbed wire all around, and those camps desolate, and no sign of any beauty, life, green, anything at all. It was just total absence of everything. One of the few government officials who objected to the internment of Japanese Americans was FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover. He said the camps were the unnecessary result of wartime hysteria. The fact that we were going to be incarcerated in these camps is a devastating feeling. These images are from home movies taken by Japanese Americans forcibly held in the camps. They reveal glimpses of what historians would later call one of the greatest civil rights violations in all of American history. While defense plants were running around the clock during the war, so were the USO dance halls. I was in Seattle, port of embarkation. We were up to our ears in men. All of the services came through there on their way to wherever they were going. We had a great time. They, whether, if they couldn't dance, we taught them. And if we didn't know their steps, they taught us. We knew those guys were, were on their way overseas. This was gonna be maybe their last big party. The departure of so many men changed the normal rhythms and patterns of American social life. For teenage girls, those changes often meant growing up very quickly. Teenage girls were more precociously sexual in some ways in the 40s than they'd been in the 30s, in part because their young boyfriends were going off to the war and they might never see them again. I'll be seeing you. One young man who was not away, kept out of the service by a broken eardrum, would begin a career about now that remained a social phenomenon for half a century. They were able to project some of that newfound sensuality onto this Frank Sinatra character who came emerging on the scene. He came at exactly the right moment to become such a cultural figure. He was an idol. I mean, he was my heartthrob, my swoon man, everything. I was a true Bobby Sox screamer. The men at the time were less enamored of Sinatra. The Army newspaper, Stars and Stripes, observed mice make women scream too. For young boys, on the home front, all the heroes were in uniform. I remember being jealous that I didn't have an, an older brother. And I remember seeing these kids come to school with patches on their jackets that their brothers had sent them in, and uh, souvenirs that they had sent from overseas. And I thought, God, I felt deprived because I didn't have a didn't have an, an older brother who would send me patches and send me souvenirs and send me a German helmet. We lived for the war movies. I mean, we fought that war in the East End Theater and the Plaza Theater and the Lakewood Theater. We go to Saturday serials, and at, at that time uh, there were a lot of war movies, like, like Wake Island. On December 6, 1942, 
December 7th, they struck by the thousands from land, from the sea. Anything from so proudly we hailed in the Purple Heart to uh, Operation Burma. You get fired up in the movies. I remember once during a movie called The Tan. We were losing badly. I think Robert Taylor was trying to hold the Japanese back and couldn't. And Lefty Brosnan, one of the kids in the neighborhood, stood up and threw a golf ball at the screen to try to stem the Japanese onslaught. And all he did was mess up the screen for the rest of the war because it had a big patch in it that you could always see there, you know. And uh, that was Lefty's patch. We played more constantly. We made our own rifles out of wooden boards. We made machine guns out of fence posts, cutting down the enemy. But we had no concept, absolutely none. Nor did most of our parents. Absolutely how brutal it was. Families on the home front weren't likely to get much of the truth about the war from the letters that GIs wrote home. What they were doing was assuring their people that they were okay, not in any danger, usually an intense lie that we were going to win the war very soon and please send another pair of dry socks and things like that. I mean, nobody ever told the truth. You know, I'm sick to death of this. I think I'm going to have a breakdown. I think I'm going to go mad. He didn't say that kind of thing because it would have bothered the recipient. American soldiers were fighting and dying on three continents. There had been victorious but costly battles in the Pacific, North Africa, and Italy. By the end of 1943, American casualties had surpassed 100,000. People with fathers or brothers or sons in combat were always conscious that that someday that knock on the door and the Western Union man would be there with a telegram, uh, you know, with the bad news. Every time the doorbell rang and I didn't know anybody was coming, you said, sitting there, is this my telegram, you know? And finally it came. We just couldn't believe it. They were coming back from Berlin. As they were getting closer to England, they got near Benthe, Germany, they were hit by flak, and they shot the plane down. Officers had to wait to jump before the other fellows jumped out. So he was about one of the last ones out. He jumped and his parachute never opened. He was too close to the ground. Out of 10 men, three of them came back. My whole world ended. He was a pilot. I'm we proud of him. I still am. This was increasingly familiar on the home front the gold stars placed in the windows of families who had lost a loved one. The realization that this was not fun anymore came to us when the kids from the neighborhood started dying in the war. Two brothers of two of my classmates died in, in that war, and uh, Jack Callahan being one, and Jimmy Warkomsky being the other. It was a small neighborhood, and it was a small parish. So then I found myself being thankful that I didn't have a brother who was at risk, uh, who, you know, that I wouldn't have to sit with my mother while she wept in church while they played taps and folded the flag and gave it to her. As the death toll rose, so did American resolve. With the fighting entering its third year, the home front was anxious for a deciding battle one that would end the war and stop the killing. By the spring